Hi, Andrew here with Michael Taylor at the Gun Rights Policy Conference uh, put on by the Second Amendment Foundation. Michael does a lot of advocacy for gun rights. Uh, he's one of the foot soldiers in there getting out there talking to representatives, senators, and other types of vermin that uh, occupy the congressional houses here locally and in other states, right? Right. Can you tell me some of what's what's on your agenda? What What are your priorities for fighting for our gun rights right now? Well, one thing we need to do is obviously defeat any incoming attempts at legislation and the newest workaround they're using is using the various initiative processes that states have to take a direct vote of the citizenry and put things into the Constitution, therefore bypassing the normal legislative process. Um, these campaigns are often met with very little access to any of the traditional media from our side and therefore voters tend to be uneducated when it comes to what they're voting for, what its effect will be and you know being from the side where we really work a lot with the facts it's very easy for us to get hung up with the idea that, well, we have all of these facts, why doesn't everyone else have these facts, yeah. right? If we read the unifying, uh, reunified crime report and say, well, look, only a couple hundred people are killed by rifles of any type, and yet rifles are what people are seeking to ban when, you know, Knives. The opposition can say, right. well, a couple hundred people is still a lot of people, and rifles are scary, so... Yeah. Right. Well, and they use the term, of course, assault weapon, which is an all-inclusive term, meaning the thing that we're trying to ban right now. It's a, it's a legal term of art. It has nothing to do with any definition aside from a legal definition that they've created. I'm originally from California, where this whole thing came down after the 101 California shooting um, in San Francisco, and an assault weapon was, you know, a, some sort of rifle or handgun or shotgun with a certain group of characteristics. Then when they got those banned, they said, ah, well, now it's time to add a few more characteristics to these different rifles, handguns, and shotguns. It's, an assault weapon is not synonymous <coughs> with an assault rifle under the law. I mean, it's, a, again, a legal term of art. And it keeps being expanded with every revision and every little dream that someone has to add something to it to just simply come out now to mean the thing that we're trying to ban. Now, I, I take a little bit of an issue with gun rights advocates focusing on assault weapon anything. Um, you're right that facts are on our side. But uh, one of the speakers was just talking about how we can be nerds sometimes and be like, that's a magazine, not a clip. And an assault oh, weapon absolutely. isn't really defined. And, and I think from your from your part of the fight, um, that's critically important. Like you were saying, assault right. weapon isn't legal. Because defined, I actually am in the offices of members of the legislature. I am in committees. I am having to educate them on yeah. the spot but about guys, what they're talking about. These guys out here, when they talk to people on Facebook or Reddit or whatever, going autist about, maybe I should say, when these guys out there... <laughs> Back up, all right, all right. That's, that's gonna get you banned, okay. When these guys out there <sighs> talk to somebody on Facebook or Reddit or whatever, I don't want you guys saying, oh yeah, this really smart lawyer dude is talking about how assault weapons aren't really all that well defined. That matters from a legal context. That matters in advocating for legislation like what you do. It's not so important for your fight. When you guys are talking with people about it, we'll write over that. If they say something stupid about how we need to ban assault weapons or whatever, that's fine to probe a little bit. Well, what do you mean by that? You sure. Know? And when somebody says something that's really factually wrong, like 
30 magazine clips a second and that sort of stuff, well, we could temper that a bit. But if you spend too much time nerding out on what the technical details of that are, you are ignoring the fact that what they're arguing about is this makes me feel bad. I'm scared right. of this. Well, and nerding is required when drafting legislation. Right? I went to law school, right? I had to learn how to draft legal documents. I get involved in very deep minutia with these things. I have to know all of my details inside and out, and I have to lay them out to my target audience. And my target audience is initially the legislature, but ultimately it's the court. Yeah. Because a law isn't a law until it has actually been seen by the court and the court has made its decision. And any legislation that you want to write needs to be drafted by someone who has been before the court, understands how the process works, and you need to not just draft the legislation, you need to draft all of the supporting documents for when it does go before so, the court. To set yourself up for those arguments so that all the I's are crossed and the T's are dotted, so and, that and, when it eventually, yeah. like our opposition seems, often seems to just throw anything against the wall because sure. they know they get the bill passed and they know they can mess with people for months or years before the court says, no, 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 that's not even close. Oh, because they want you know, the other side to expend its resources, taking this to court. They want to shift that Overton window. Right. And they want to harass um, gun owners un until the next thing, because it's right. just constantly rolling. What, what are you working on? What, what, is, what is the next, um, what's the next push for, for our side? There are a number of things that we can attack, and I'm still working on certain policies for instance, some ideas are, think about the interaction of Heller with the recent bump stock ban. Okay. So, so if, if Heller, Heller being, DC uh, versus Heller, right. DC versus Heller affirmed the individual right to keep and bear arms as opposed to a collective militia. And right. more importantly, from this standpoint, DC versus Heller also provided what is currently being used in the circuits as the test for whether something is covered by the Second Amendment or not. And that... Militarily credible. No. No, no. That, that would be, uh, that would be that, Miller. That was Miller. This is um, not Heller. In common use. Right. So the common use for lawful purposes test. Think about it. If we end up agreeing that a bump stock is in and of itself, much like a shoelace, a machine gun, then at some point in the past few years, we had several million machine guns in lawful use, right? Yeah. In common use for a lawful purpose. And therefore, can you actually ban machine guns now? Nice. If, if we agree, <laughs> so so what you're saying is that the anti-gun lobby, and let's let's be honest, it's incredibly well funded by the one percent. Oh, and and I'm doing all of my stuff pro bono here in Arizona. Yeah. So I am making myself poor to defend a right that I believe in. Yeah. Um, Bloomberg is not making himself poor. No, <laughs> not even remotely. But he's spending a whole lot more money than either of us will probably earn in our entire lives. More than I will see in my life. Just one little pet sure. issue that he has. Right. But you're saying that the anti-gun lobby may have put their foot in it with the bump stock thing in that they, all right, fine, fine, it's a machine gun. Well, we just had a whole bunch of lawful machine guns out there. We did. Until they weren't lawful anymore. Right. And one misuse that we can point to, and again, it was an atrocious misuse. Of course. But, you know, there was an atrocious misuse of fertilizer in Oklahoma at one point. And, and of course, that the loser that shot people in Vegas was also a licensed pilot and owned a plane, and thank God right. 
he used a rifle instead of a plane full of kerosene. Right. Or, you know, in uh, the south of France or in Germany, stealing a dump truck or a cement truck to drive through crowds. You know, there are always things that you can do and that have been done. But more to the point, when the ATF drafts these proposals and they submit them to the public, first, they always do a bait and switch. Um, if you look at 41F, it um, made a whole bunch of proposals. It then asked for comment on those. Um, attorneys like myself, citizens and so on, submitted uh, various, say, uh, responses to those. And then nothing that was in the original proposal actually made it into 41F, and so all of their responses to the comments that were given during that public comment time were, well, this point is moot because we're not doing that. This point is moot because we're not doing that. And at no point did the ATF ever give anyone the ability to talk about the actual rule that they put forth. Yeah. Because they put forth a rule that rule was just torn apart, and they then put forth a new rule so they, and they said, did not have any this. commentary on it. We're going to do this. We said, we don't like that. They said, okay, great, we'll change it. Thanks, thanks for your input, right. and it's changed. Everything's fixed now. And, and, and that was what they did. So rather than then resubmitting with a new proposal for new commentary, they simply said, oh, well, I guess we're good now. Because we have... Because we say so. Because right. reasons. Exactly. We have our reasons. Trust us. And I work with the ATF with some frequency, and I like the people at the ATF who I work with. You know, it's not made up of a bunch of faceless automatons who, you know, all they want to do is rubber stamp something. They take their marching orders from other people. Um, so, but regardless, on things like uh, the bump stock ban, <clears throat> which uh, also sought to get rid of binary triggers and a bunch of other things, uh, which if you read the four pages of their response on binary triggers, that's all just them direct quoting me. Um, and the reason why they can't get rid of binary triggers is because they sought to redefine the term function of the trigger mm -hmm. to be synonymous with pull. Whereupon I pointed out that that suddenly makes a modus no longer yeah. a machine gun. Yeah, it's because, because you press correct. You push down and forward. Kind of. and, yeah. and there are all sorts of mechanisms that aren't pull, and in this day and age, I can have a computer mechanism where I swipe right yeah. to go full auto, swipe left to go yeah. semi-auto. In, in the past, and, the ATF <clears throat> maintained that basically any sort of electrical, electronic initiation system, no matter how it was arranged, they, they decided, well, yeah, that's that's a machine gun. And, and to some extent, you could say, like, take one of those uh, Gatling trigger Sure, activators. put a drill on it. It, it does stand to reason that it, within that context, right. if you're like, okay, um, something that you pull the trigger and it ba 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 shoots, that's right. a machine gun. Well, and well, when, and now, there you've actually moved yeah, what is the trigger exactly. the, onto the power is, drill. All right, now the trigger's on the power drill. So right. And I'm not happy with. It. I don't like it, but but, but that's it's consistent. A, that's a fair, logical, rational argument. Right. Same with the piece of string, right? Making the shoe string. What happens is, if you have tied it around everything in a different way, you then interact with the string, and the string causes the weapon yeah. to continue to fire until you stop yeah. interacting with the string. You've what changed the things, changed the trigger to the string. One of the things that um, I've... One, one thing I'm curious about with the whole... Um, string interpretation. Sure. Some of the other 
that one's a really good example. One of the things that I'm really curious about with with uh, a shoelaces and machine gun right. idea is that is how that interfaces with constructive possession. Does that mean that every single one of us is in constructive possession of a machine gun? If you have a firearm with a reciprocating bolt and a string, are you in constructive possession? And if that's the case, well then, isn't everyone in, destructive, in constructive possession of a destructive device because they have a glass bottle and flammable liquid and some kind of clothing in the house? And if that's the case, can we charge some of our political opponents with constructive possession for, I mean, normally, correct me if I'm wrong because you're the lawyer, but normally when you want to challenge a law, you choose somebody on your side that you want to use as a test case. But what if we used them as the test case for constructive possession? Well, so here's the problem. The problem is we, and the problem is also the type of law we're talking about. If we're talking about criminal law, then the we who is going to be doing any sort of charge is going Say to a be sheriff in Texas. Well, no, no, it's not a sheriff. It's going to be the prosecutor, okay. right? So the sheriff will recommend to the prosecutor okay. that the prosecutor files charges against this individual for whatever crime they see. But this is not a situation where there is really a we involved. If it's a, a lawsuit, if it's a, you know, a tort, if it's something like that, then yes, we yeah. can initiate that. If our <laughs> rights have been violated, we can initiate a suit to stop the violation of our rights. But the state would have to arrest and charge someone for constructive possession. And, Correct. And, and, and because it's a federal law, we would need someone to recommend federal charges. Right. And, of course, a federal charge can be brought by numerous entities. It doesn't have to be any one specific entity. But also think about similar state statutes. I mean, having a yeah. Molotov cocktail is not going to make... Arizona happy either, simply due to but state statutes. So you can in, use those as well. In, many, in most states, it's, it's a, uh, most states don't have the constructive possession part of it though, right? Well, so constructive possession isn't necessarily a part of something that is state initiated. Constructive possession is so an ATF opinion about Well, it's, it's not, it's an, not an AT, I mean, it, it could be an ATF opinion and that's fine. That doesn't get them any mileage. What gets them mileage is a prosecutor making the argument yeah. that this constructive possession somehow needs to be prosecuted. And they will use as evidence ATF rulings and so on, and then the court will defer to the body that is in charge of those regulations and assume that they are competent to make these decisions, and that's where the ATF comes in. But the ATF and any sort of ruling or opinion that they have issued only comes in if the prosecutor decides to bring that in. That's not something that, you know, is some state statute that someone passed necessarily. I mean, it, it, state legislatures are certainly free to pass anything they want on any topic they feel like, so long as it's within their purview. Okay. Um, so if it's within their purview, sure, they can pass a constructive possession law for anything they want. But by and large, where this is coming from is prosecutorial discretion to use rulings or opinions from the ATF or any other organization. Okay. Let's, let's shift gears sure. a lot. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so let's, let's dramatically change top. Uh, so let's dramatically change topics. And, and now for something completely different. Right. A man with three buttons. <laughs> <clears throat> so aside from your professional fight, right. uh, what do you think personally um, in our conversation, what should I be doing to 
help the, let me start over. Let's dramatically shift gears and now for something completely different. Uh, aside from your professional fight, what, what do you think are the most important things that all of us should be working on to advance gun rights? What, what issue do you think is at the forefront right now? I think understanding that we're talking about human rights here. These aren't rights that are just held by specific individuals. These are, these are not rights for the rich. These are not rights for people of any ethnicity, any gender identity, anything. These are human rights. And we need to make sure that like-minded individuals go out to their community and to use a term that's currently being thrown about in uh, various circles, normalize the concept of firearm ownership. So on that topic, open carry. Open tell carry. Me, <laughs> tell me what you think about people um, openly carrying arms, whether that's a slung rifle or a holstered pistol, in the context of shift, shifting the Overton window and normalizing the carry of arms, do you think that open carry is useful for, for that, or do you feel like it makes a spectacle where there shouldn't be one? Well, let's take a step back to the late 1960s, California, mm -hmm. the Black Panther Party. The Black Panthers the root of modern gun control movement is, Indeed. is when they the, stood on the steps of the Capitol and were going to carry arms. Correct. And, and With Reagan shotguns. And <clears throat> the reason why California, and I'm from San Francisco originally, the reason why California lost its ability to open carry a loaded firearm is directly in response to the civil rights movement directly in response mm -hmm. to actions taken by the Black Panthers to further their agenda and to further equal rights and racial equality. And you don't have to agree with anyone's specific method of doing that. You don't have to agree with <clears throat> how someone exercises their right to free speech. But what you have to agree with is that they have the right to exercise free speech. Absolutely. And you have to agree that they have the right to exercise the carrying of arms. So to pretend like Ronald Reagan and the California legislature won back in the late 60s. <clears throat> and, oh well, I guess we're just going to have to not openly carry loaded firearms because, well, the Black Panthers did it and, well, we don't want to be associated with that. Why don't we want to be associated with free speech? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you don't have to be associated with the Black Panthers. You don't have to be associated with any of their and, methods. And the Black Panthers had so, some methods and some um, economic policies that may not resonate with everybody else. But um, but they don't have I, to. I believe it's free speech. If you value individual rights, that you need to stop letting uh, the elites drive wedges between us that, you know what, you and I maybe disagree on economic policies, let's just sure. take that, but we agree on a lot, and we need to, we need to focus on the things that we agree about, that we agree on, we need to welcome everyone who agrees with us, and, and recruit, we need to, we need to stop cheerleading for a red team or a blue team. I mean, fine, I, I'm not saying don't vote for a Republican or a Democrat, fine, whatever. But stop cheerleading for them when they stand in direct opposition to the things that you say that you support. Oh, yeah. The problem with 
taking any specific group's agenda and trying to say every single thing that someone who says they're a Republican or says they're a Democrat or a Libertarian, everything they say, I'm going to incorporate it into my belief system. Yeah. Is a really bad idea, I think, for individuals and for society. You shouldn't accept everything I personally say. I've got Why some bad I? ideas that I'm a little blind to, let alone a a strict, rigid set of planks. Well, <laughs> and and remember, to attract people from different places. There is no test to register as a Republican, a Democrat, a Libertarian. So just because someone went in and put a D on a piece of paper and said, this is what I'm going to be, does not mean that they speak for everyone with a D, doesn't mean that they speak for everyone with an R, because you are free to associate with any of these groups. That's your right. And in fact, it's only because you can drive large swaths of policy that you would ally yourself with these groups. Yeah. And most people understand that you have to take the good with the bad, but a lot of people lose sight of that. They think, well, that's my guy because I voted for this person on this subject. And therefore, if now she changes her mind and she has this stance on something that I disagree with, well, you know, or that I, I don't know about. Right. <coughs> I mean, maybe um, you voted for John Doe because he was he was advocating for I don't know. Let's say he was advocating for gun rights, but um, now he's he's got a position for or against say net neutrality. But you don't know anything about net neutrality. You're like, I like him on gun rights, so I'll just, ex you know what, he's probably right on net neutrality also. And I don't think that that's the case. I think that in the majority of cases, if if you have the time to sit down and really understand each subject that came in front of a politician, that I think that you would disagree with most of the stuff they're trying to do. I think that most people out there would disagree with most of the things that politicians are trying to do most of the time. You know, I sit in their offices frequently, and I know a lot of the things that come in front of them. I have to sit through lengthy committee meetings until I get to speak on my bill. And the questions that come out of politicians' mouths on all sorts of topics, when this is in a committee, and these are the people who are ostensibly charged with being at least proficient in the area of that committee, be it, you know, a public safety committee or any other committee, the sheer volume of information that they are lacking on all of the topics coming before them can be staggering and can also be entertaining to watch because yeah. it's available. The shoulder thing that goes up. Right. And, but all of these committee meetings are available online if you just go to your state government's website. You can usually either watch the live stream or watch recordings of these things and you can find out all of the things that they don't know yeah. while, as they say, the sausage is being made. Yeah. You know, I mean, the old saying, you never want to see your laws being made or your sausages being made because then you find out what's gone on. Or uh, jail test YouTube videos for that matter. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we want to see all the behind the scenes of your gel tests. Come on. <laughs> no. Um. Right, It'll I, be got, what, one long stream stuff. of bleeping, right? <laughs> yeah. We got a lot of good stuff. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you like one really open-ended question. Just talk on whatever you want, and then we'll wrap up and we'll get you back to the air conditioning. All right. And was that the open-ended question, or do you have one <laughs> coming? <laughs> you know what? The, I guess, the, the, right, the statement right, that you right, made. Right. Thank you for your attempt to destroy my editing process. All right, all right. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, you, you did just make a statement, not did, a question. I did. Um, shit, is Mike? Mickey. 
or Michael. Michael, sorry. Um, Michael, I appreciate you taking the time to stand out in the hot sun and discuss some of these, these issues with me. Your perspective being inside of all that is really important. And, you know, hopefully we, we can have some time to, to catch up again outside of this. Yeah. Uh, but before I go, what else do you want to tell ARF Commerce? I know you think it's a really good idea to get an AR-15 in 7.62 by 39, but come on, guys. <laughs> I mean, is there some sort of a weird AK envy or something? I don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I've shot them, sure, but eh. I mean, it's like, it's like kissing your sister and saying that you kissed a woman. I mean, technically, you did. technically that's true. I'm not talking to you folks in Alabama. <laughs> but for the rest of us, except for it the one we are, really <laughs> um, the one the guy who has an internet connection in, in Alabama, right? Right. Okay. Aside from the fact that uh, <laughs> Alabama so is chock full of uh, high tech stuff, so. Yeah. But hey, I'm everyone in Dothan. Uh, I actually, I took uh, my basic electronics training for AIT in um, Redstone Arsenal, which is outside of Huntsville. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, Werner von Braun. All of these folks, yeah, that's kind of Alabama. I mean, yeah. you can you can joke about it, let me, let but it's it's off. super high tech. So, yeah. Um, I'll just do one thing. Or if you'd like, like, sorry, if you'd like me to uh, no, re I'm redo good. my message. Uh, yeah, you're good. Yeah, no, okay. that was perfect. Uh, again, thank you, Michael. I'm gonna get back inside, check out some of these other speakers.